Wow, we are going to learn so many cool things on this homeschool pop video. All right, what's the first thing we should learn? How about... The human brain. Doesn't that sound cool and intriguing and maybe a little bit gross? Well, it's going to be a lot of fun because the brain is an amazing, amazing part of your body. And you're going to understand it after watching this video. I know. We're going to jump right in. It's going to be so cool. So what is a brain? I mean, here in this drawing, it almost looks like it's like bubble gum. What is a brain? Well, the brain is an organ of the body. Isn't that interesting? It's an organ of the body. All right, so what is an organ? <laughs> we have to know that to know what a brain is. If the brain is an organ of the body, what is an organ? It's interesting. An organ is a special group of tissues that do specific jobs for your body. Like your heart. Your heart is a special group of tissues that does a specific job for your body. An eyeball is an organ too. It's a special group of tissues that does a specific job for your body. And how about a kidney? A kidney is an organ that's a special group of tissues that does a specific job for your body. See, the brain isn't like just some wad of gum. The brain is a special group of tissues. And not only that, remember an organ is a special group of tissues that do specific jobs for your body. They do different jobs. They have tasks to do. So we know there are special tasks that the brain has to do, but what does the brain do? What is it that the brain does? Well, this might sound crazy, okay? This might, I hope you're sitting down, this might sound a little crazy. The brain controls most of the activities of the body. Your brain is like the control center of your body. When you sit down, your brain told your body to sit down. When you stand up, your brain told your body to stand up. It's amazing. Your brain controls most of the activities of your body. Wait, what? what's with this sad music? I mean, this is not a sad thing. The brain controls most of the activities of the body, but that's a... That's a good thing. Who's playing this sad music right now? Seriously? Kittens? Two kittens playing the piano. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding? They're cute, but come on, all right? Tell them, to, if they're going to play piano, tell them to play the right kind of music. Okay, it's not much to ask. Tell them to play the right kind of music. All right, that's better. So the brain controls most of the activities of the body, and that's a really good thing. You see, the brain is really powerful. <laughs> oh my goodness. The brain is really, 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 really powerful. It does a great job of controlling the activities of your body. Your brain is a champ. It's like the control center of your body, and your brain does a phenomenal job. Wait, but how does something that almost looks like a wad of bubble gum control most of the activities of your body? How does that even work? Well, your brain uses something called the nervous system. Yeah, the nervous system. It's different than this kind of nervous. This man, his team is behind, okay? It's near the end of the game. He doesn't know if they're going to be able to win. And he's sitting there wearing his cape. He's nervous. This is a different type of nervous. The nervous system is how the brain is able to control the actions of your body. 
And here's how it works. Here is where your brain is. And here is where something called the spinal cord is. Now the brain and the spinal cord work together to send information called signals. These signals are sent to what are called your nerves. Your nerves enable your body to do what your brain directed, and that is how the brain is able to control most of the actions of your body. The brain and spinal cord make up what's called the central nervous system, where information is processed and sent out as signals. And those nerves that go throughout your whole body, those are called the peripheral nervous system. And these arrows are just pointing to just a few that are in the arm, but they go all over the place and they receive these signals from the brain. How cool is that? From the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, the peripheral nervous system gets the signals and is like, okay, let's do this. And what's so cool, it can work the other way around where the nerves can actually send signals to the spinal cord and to the brain. Let's say you're playing outside and you fall and you hurt your knee. Your nerves, which are part of the peripheral nervous system, send out a signal and say, uh-oh, uh-oh, pain, I'm hurt, I'm hurt in the knee. That signal gets sent to the brain and spinal cord, which are the central nervous system, and your brain processes that information so you can take the action that you need to take, which is to take care of your knee. Hey, did you know the brain, because it controls most of the activities of your body, needs to be protected? That is why it's so amazing that your brain lives here, in something called the skull. Your brain lives in the skull. Your skull is really hard and protects your brain because your brain controls most of the activities of your body. But not only that, The brain is also responsible for all of your thinking and dreaming and imagining. Have you ever sat down and just thought and planned? All of that is using your brain. How incredible! So good that your brain lives in your skull so it can be protected because not only does it control most of the activities of your body, but also you do your thinking with your brain, your imagining with your brain, even your dreaming with your brain. How incredible is the human brain? And if you want to know a secret, you were using your brain the whole time you were watching this video as you were learning. You're using your brain. How cool is that? We love the brain. The brain is so, so awesome. Hey, Petey. I know, I know, I heard about your plane. You know, it's a cool plane, you know, and and it's it's neat. I, I don't know if it flies or you you look pretty confident that it's going to fly, which is cool. Yeah, I, I see you. Hello. Hello. Yeah, thanks for waving. Thanks for saying hello. You know, we're actually in the middle of learning. We're, we're in the middle of learning a lot of new cool things right now. So I actually do have to go. Hi, you're still waving. Okay. Um, we're gonna go, uh, because now we need to learn about reptiles. This is amazing. This is awesome. You know, the world has many different types of animals. One of the most fascinating types are the reptiles, and you're about to see why. But first, let's meet some of these reptiles. Snakes. Turtles, crocodiles, geckos, lizards, and chameleons. Now look at these incredible animals. They're all reptiles. What do they all have in common? We're about to find out what makes all these animals reptiles. 
First of all, they are covered with scales. Not with hair or feathers, but with scales. Look at this incredible iguana. Oh my goodness, covered in scales. I mean, just look at these scales. These scales are dry and they're waterproof. And they cover the bodies of reptiles just like this iguana. Reptiles aren't covered in fur, they're not covered in hair, they're not covered in feathers, they're covered in these waterproof scales. Look at this massive snake. You can see that the snake is covered with scales. Remember, snakes are reptiles, and reptiles are covered with scales. Look at all these scales, absolutely covered with these intricate scales. Here's an interesting example of scales. This is an albino alligator, which means the alligator is very pale. And you can see that this alligator is covered with scales, but the alligator also has these bony plates on his back. You can kind of see them there in the corner. Those are not scales, but reptiles also can have those bony plates, but this alligator is still covered with scales. Scales are a big clue that an animal is a reptile. The second thing you need to know about reptiles is reptiles breathe in oxygen. Just like we breathe in oxygen, reptiles have to breathe in oxygen to survive. Now, just like people, reptiles have two lungs in their body. Lungs bring in new air and pump out the old air. Even reptiles that live in and near water, like crocodiles and alligators, have to breathe in air to survive. Now this is so fascinating. Did you know reptiles are cold-blooded? Cold-blooded means that their bodies don't keep them warm automatically. They have to have sunlight to keep them warm. Here's a picture of a lizard that's soaking in some sunlight. This is very important for this lizard because, as with all the other reptiles, this lizard is cold-blooded. That means that the temperature of the lizard needs to have sunlight to keep it warm. It doesn't warm automatically. This lizard is cold-blooded. Here's a snake that's in the sunlight. The sunlight is helping to warm the body of this snake. This doesn't happen automatically with the snake's body because the snake is cold-blooded just like the other reptiles. Hey, here's a picture of a chameleon. Chameleons are just so cool. Now, of course, this chameleon is cold-blooded because all of the reptiles are cold-blooded. If they want to get warmer, they have to go to the sunlight because their bodies don't warm them. They're cold-blooded. Wow, I mean, right? I mean, these are incredible creatures. You know, reptiles, they're covered in these dry, waterproof scales. They breathe in oxygen with those two lungs like we do. They're cold-blooded, which is so fascinating. Can you imagine having to lay out in the sun if you wanted to warm your body instead of your body being able to do it on its own? These are fascinating creatures. Hey, d do you have a favorite reptile? It's okay, you don't have to tell me, but... Cool. Very cool. Yeah, it's, you know, you figure snakes, turtles, crocodiles, alligators, geckos, lizards, chameleons, I mean, reptiles are just the coolest, aren't they? I mean, they're, ju they're just absolutely amazing. Hey, when is it going to be my turn? I want to be in this compilation video, too. Okay, let's see. I'm going to teach about pollination. Hi, look at all these beautiful flowers that I've found. Let's look at some more. These flowers are so pretty. Look at how bluey, purpley they are. They're just so beautiful. And these ones are so red and... <gasps> <Achoo! laughs> 
Oh, oh, excuse me. These ones are so red and brilliant. Achoo! And look at all the pretty colors. Achoo! It's so, achoo! It's so beautiful. I love these flowers, but all the pollen is making me sneeze and sniffly. So I think we should go back inside. Alright, that's better. Well, flowers, they make pollen, and pollen is a fine powder. It's usually yellow, and it can make you sneeze, just like me earlier. Flowers use pollen to make seeds through a process called pollination. Okay, do you see these yellow feathery parts of the flower? This is the male part of the flower called the stamen, and that is where the pollen is made. Now this middle pink part of the flower is called the pistil, which is the female part of the flower. This is where the pollen needs to go so the flower can make seeds. Looking at this flower, do you think the yellow parts are the stamen or the pistil? That's right, that's the stamen. The stamen is the male part of the flower. That's the part that makes pollen. Now here's a different flower. Do you think this purple part in the middle is the stamen or the pistil? Very good, that's the pistil. The pistil is the female part of the flower where the pollen needs to go so that the flower can make seeds. When pollen is moved from the stamen to the pistil, it is called pollination. There are flowers that have both a stamen and a pistil, but there are some flowers that have only a pistil, and there are other flowers that have only a stamen. Pollen can't move by itself, so how will it get to the pistil? With the help of pollinators. Do you recognize this well-known pollinator? Very good, that's a honeybee. Honeybees are pollinators, and you can see the yellowy-orange pollen on his leg right here. Pollinators are pollen helpers by moving the pollen to the pistil so the flower can make seeds. Let's look at some other pollinators. Do you know what this pollinator is called? That's right, this is a butterfly. And this one is called a painted lady butterfly. Butterflies are pollinators. What kind of animal is this? That's right, that's a bat. This is a flying fox, which is a fruit bat. And fruit bats are pollinators too. What's this little guy called? Great job, this is a hummingbird. It's a ruby-throated hummingbird. And hummingbirds are also pollinators. Other pollinators include wasps and moths. Ants and beetles, like this ladybug, are pollinators too. These other pollinators are very well known. They are bumblebees and honeybees. All right, let's review what we've learned today. What is the fine yellow powder on this bee called? That's right, it's pollen. Pollen is a fine yellow powder. This yellow part of the flower makes pollen. Do you remember what it's called? That's right, that's the stamen. The stamen is the male part of the flower. That's the part that makes pollen. Why do flowers use pollen? Great job! Flowers use pollen to make seeds. This purple part of the flower is where the pollen needs to go so the flower can make seeds. Do you remember what it's called? Very good! That's the pistil. The pistil is the female part of the flower where the pollen needs to go so that the flower can make seeds. What is the process called when pollen is moved from the stamen to the pistil? 
Great job! When pollen is moved from the stamen to the pistil, it is called pollination. What is the name of the pollen helpers who move the pollen so the flower can make seeds? That's right, they're called pollinators. Pollinators are pollen helpers by moving the pollen to the pistil so the flower can make seeds. Now you know how the flowers around you make more flowers. Pollinators help them through a process called pollination so they can make seeds. You have been doing a great job, just like Mike, who's doing these push-ups. You know, he knows it's important to stay fit and to exercise and to stay healthy. And you're, like, exercising your mind right now, which is super cool. And next, we are going to learn about earthquakes. And the first thing we need to understand is the Earth has an outer shell. Isn't that interesting? This outer shell is called the crust. Crust, you know, like you know, like bread crust. And I, I hope you enjoy bread crust, by the way, because you can't eat the crust of the earth. But I hope that you're eating the bread crust. You know, it's still yummy. It's on the outside. In fact, it's really healthy. It's really great. Okay, let's get back to the crust of the earth. You know, you don't eat the earth's crust, but hopefully you eat this kind of crust. Okay. The surface of the earth is part of this outer shell. Remember, the outer shell is called the crust. This means that hills, mountains, and valleys are all part of the earth's crust. That means even the floor of the ocean is part of the earth's crust. <laughs> Woohoo! So what is the outer shell of the earth? Yeah, the crust. And you know, it's fascinating. The crust has lots of pieces and is almost like a jigsaw puzzle. And you might not realize this, but these pieces of crust are always moving. In fact, they're moving right now. The pieces of crust that are below you right now are moving. They're always moving. Now usually the crust moves slowly. It doesn't move very fast. When the crust moves slowly, you don't feel it. The pieces are moving beneath you, but you don't even know because they're moving very, very slowly. You can't even feel it. Sometimes, however, the pieces of crust can move really fast. They can move quickly. When the pieces of crust are moving quickly, an earthquake can happen. So when the pieces of crust move slowly, you don't feel it. But when the pieces of crust move quickly, you could have an earthquake. Earthquakes begin under Earth's surface and shake the ground. Here's a picture of something that can happen when there's an earthquake. Do you see the massive cracks in the ground? This is from an earthquake. The earthquake began under the Earth's surface. It shook the ground and it caused this crack. Oh my goodness, look at this picture that shows damage from an earthquake. See, earthquakes can also break down buildings, bridges, and roads. They don't just cause cracks in the ground. They break all kinds of things around us. Earthquakes are so powerful, they can change Earth's surface. Well, you may be wondering, where do earthquakes start? Earthquakes start underground at a place called the Focus. You can see it here on the picture. Now, that's a weird name for it, I know. It's called a Focus. We don't know why, but that's just the way it is. It's called the Focus. It's where the earthquake starts. The earthquake is the strongest at the spot above the Focus called the Epicenter. You can see from the picture it's directly above. 
When an earthquake happens, you don't want to be anywhere near the epicenter. While earthquakes are very powerful, they don't last that long. In fact, most earthquakes last less than a minute. And remember, a minute is 60 seconds. It's not too long. And did you know this earthquake fact? Earthquakes get scored by how strong they are. <laughs> That's pretty neat. Earthquakes get their own score, their own number. Scientists use seismographs to measure and score earthquakes. The bigger the number, the stronger the earthquake. So here are some common earthquake scores. A one or a two earthquake, you barely feel it. The three to six range of earthquakes, there are gonna be some damage, but seven plus any number that's seven or higher for an earthquake score, that's a massive earthquake, and there's going to be tons of damage. Remember, the Earth has an outer shell, and this outer shell is called the crust. The crust has lots of pieces, and it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle, and all the pieces are always moving. But if they move too fast, that can cause an earthquake, and an earthquake changes the Earth's surface and can damage roads, bridges, buildings, and even crack up the Earth. And remember, the earthquake is the strongest at the spot above the focus called the epicenter. You don't want to be anywhere near the epicenter if an earthquake was to happen. Thanks for learning about earthquakes with us, a powerful way that Earth's surface changes. Uh, oh, oh, this is such a heavy cart. Oh my goodness. Ooh, ooh, it's hard work. You know, a lot of times learning can be hard work too, but we hope that these videos are really helpful and make learning fun so that learning isn't hard like pushing this cart. Oh my goodness. All right. Uh, what's the next thing we should learn about? Let's learn about the plant parts and their functions. Okay, so plants have six parts. All right, so how many plant parts are there? <laughs> yeah, six. There are six plant parts. The first three help plants get water, make food, and grow. They are roots, stems, and leaves. The second three help plants grow new plants. They are flowers, fruit, and seeds. So let's learn the plant parts one by one. First, the parts that help the plant get water, make food, and grow. Okay, so the first plant part we're going to look at today are the roots. Roots have a special job. You see, roots hold the plant in the soil. The soil is the dirt in the ground. Then, roots bring water and nutrients from the soil to the plant. Roots are usually underground, but can be above ground, too. Have you ever seen a tree that looks like this, where the roots are above ground? Remember, the roots hold the plant to the soil. Okay, so now we're going to look at the second part of a plant, which are the stems. 
Now the stems hold the plant up above ground. The stems carry water and food through the plant. Stems are the delivery system of the plant. Roots get water and nutrients from the soil, and the stems carry the water and nutrients throughout the plant. Remember, the stem holds the plant above ground. The next part of the plant we're going to learn today are leaves. The leaves are on the end of the stems of plants. And this is interesting. Leaves are where plants make most of their food. Leaves take in air, and they use air, water, and sunlight to make food. Remember, leaves are on the end of the stems. Okay, so next, the parts that help the plant make new plants. The next part we're going to look at are flowers. Flowers, like leaves, grow on the end of the stems. Flowers are often the most colorful part of the plant. Okay, now this is awesome. The rich colors of flowers help attract pollinators. That's why they're beautiful. The beauty has a purpose. After getting pollinated, flowers can make seeds and fruit. Do you love fruit? Yes, fruit is awesome. You have flowers to thank for that. Flowers make fruit. So the next time you're eating an amazing piece of fruit, just think to yourself, oh, thank you, flowers. Thank you, flowers. Remember, flowers are the colorful growths on the stems. The next part of the plant we're going to learn about is the fruit. All right, now where on the plant is the fruit? Fruit hangs on the end of stems. Now, you might be wondering, what's the fruit's job? What does the fruit do? Well, the fruit's job is to hold the seeds. The fruit is just a delicious seed holder. Now, either one of two things happens to fruit. Fruit is either picked and eaten, or it falls off the plant and rots. Remember, fruit is the tasty stuff on the stems. Okay, the last part of the plant that we're going to learn today are the seeds. So where are the seeds of the plant? Seeds hide inside of the fruit. Now the seeds have an incredible job. You see, seeds grow into new plants. Okay, you might be wondering, well, how does that work? Well, here's one way. When animals eat fruit, they eat the seeds. Later, the seeds leave the animal through its waste wherever the animal is. This is called dispersal. Or, fruit falls from the tree and rots. The word rots means dies. The fruit dies. It rots. The seeds fall out and can make 
a new plant. The first way, called dispersal, takes the seed to another place so it plants a new plant in a new place. When a fruit falls and rots, it plants a new plant nearby the original plant. Remember, seeds live inside of the fruit. Hey, it looked like you were doing a good job paying attention, learning about the plant parts, and now we want to see how much you learned. We're going to play a game called Name the Plant Part. We're going to show you a plant part, and then you go ahead and tell us which plant part it is. Alright, hope you're ready, because here we go. Look at this picture of a plant. Which plant part is colored in? Uh-huh. The fruit. The fruit of this plant. Great job. Here's the next one. What plant part is colored in? are colored in. Great job. All right, it's time for this one. It's colored brown. Which plant part is this? Uh-huh. The roots. Awesome. Okay, let's try this one. What part of the plant is colored in? Do you see it there on the bottom? What is that? Yeah, what part is that? Yes! The seeds! Let's try this one. Look at the picture. Could you name the plant part? Which plant part is that? You can see it's outlined in color. Yeah, the flowers! Awesome job! Hey, whoa, okay, first of all, elephants don't drive, okay? Elephants can't get a driver's license, and he's driving on the grass! He's driving on the grass! You're gonna ruin the lawn, okay? What's going on here? Alright, this is out of hand. Okay, <sighs> elephant, I don't want to tell you what you can do and what you can't do, but you can't drive, alright? Oh, my goodness. Alright, next we are going to learn about the human heart, the different parts of your heart, how it works, how it functions. We're going to have such a great time. Okay, well, let's start here. What is the heart? That's a great question. What is the heart? Well, the heart is an organ of your body. Yeah, that's right. The heart is an organ of your body. Okay, so what is an organ? Yeah, we have to know that to know what a heart is. If the heart is an organ of the body, what is an organ? It's interesting. An organ is a special group of tissues that do specific jobs for your body. Like your brain. Your brain is an organ. It's a special group of tissues that does a specific job for your body. An eyeball is an organ too. It's a special group of tissues that does a specific job for your body. And how about a kidney? A kidney is an organ that's a special group of tissues that does a specific job for your body. So we know the heart is a special group of tissues, don't we? Because it's an organ, and an organ is a special group of tissues. But that's not all. We 
remember an organ is a special group of tissues that do specific jobs for your body. They do different jobs. They have tasks to do. So, what does the heart do? Well, we can see it's moving, isn't it? The heart is constantly moving. Wow! So what does the heart do for your body? That is a really good question. Why am I asking you that question? Why am I not just telling you the answer? <laughs> All right, let's tell you. Well, here it is. The heart pumps blood through the body. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? The heart pumps blood through the body. Your heart is a big pump. And it's pumping blood through your body as you're watching this video right now. You're watching Homeschool Pop. You're having a great time. And even right now, your heart is pumping blood through your body. Isn't that incredible? So how does your heart do that? And why am I in a grocery store? <laughs> I guess I'm hungry for fish again. So the heart has four chambers. Four chambers. If anyone ever asks you, how many chambers does your heart have? You'll say, my heart has four chambers. That word chamber almost means like a room. It's almost like your heart has four rooms. It has four chambers. There's the right atrium, and there's the left atrium. These are the top chambers of your heart. Then the lower two chambers are the right ventricle and the left ventricle. Pretty simple. The heart has four chambers. Two on the top, two on the bottom. So here is how the heart pumps blood through the body. The blood comes in through these valves right here into the right atrium and the left atrium. Do you see those arrows? The blood flows in. Then, the blood goes into the ventricles, the right ventricle and the left ventricle. Isn't that pretty cool? Then the blood leaves the ventricles through these valves up here, and it's ready to replenish the body with the oxygen and nutrients that your body needs. This is all made possible because the heart is a muscular organ, meaning it has lots of muscles. Those muscles are what enables it to pump blood through your body. Isn't that cool? It's such a strong organ. The heart pumps blood to every part of your body through the veins and arteries. This is called the circulatory system. Isn't that amazing? It enables your entire body to get the oxygen and nutrients that it needs so you can be healthy and strong. The heart, what an amazing organ that pumps blood through your body so you can stay strong and healthy. Here's our friend Fred. We heard that he just took up the harp. He just started playing the harp. Fred, we can't we can't hear you. We're having audio problems with Fred right now. Fred, you look so happy playing. We we can't hear you, okay? You got you got to wear your mic or something. We can't hear the music. Oh, he doesn't even know. He doesn't even, isn't that nice? You know, Fred is just plucking away. He's having a good time. You know, kind of like we're having a good time right now with these learning videos. And next, we are going to learn about the planets of the solar system. Now, as we begin, we have to answer this question. What are planets? Huh, this is a really good question. What are planets? Planets are round objects that orbit the sun. Here is a picture of the sun. It's the largest star in our solar system. It's massive. And you can see there's a ring around it. Those are some solar flares, fire shooting out of the sun. Absolutely amazing and stunning. And it kind of looks like a pizza, actually. It kind of gets me hungry. I don't know. Doesn't it look like a cheese pizza? Oh, it's really yummy. 
The word orbit means to circle around. That means planets are round objects that circle around the sun. Hey, what 3D shape is a planet? Think about it. What 3D shape is a planet? We know that a planet is round. What 3D shape is perfectly round? Yeah, a sphere. Yeah, planets are spheres. They're perfectly round. Yeah, good job. To summarize, planets are spheres that go around the sun. Pretty simple, huh? Hey, did you know there are two types of planets? Yeah, it's really interesting. There are two types of planets. Okay, so there are primary planets and there are dwarf planets. Those are the two types of planets. Now there are eight primary planets. These are the main planets that you think of, the main planets that are circling around the sun, and these are the planets we're going to be studying in this video. And then there are five dwarf planets. These planets are a lot smaller and are not considered primary planets. <laughs> Sorry, Pluto. Wow, there they are, the primary planets. You're going to get to know all eight of these primary planets. You're going to know them so well. Oh my goodness, this is going to be awesome. The first planet is Mercury. Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. The second planet is Venus. Pretty cool, huh? The second planet is Venus. Our planet, Earth, is the third planet from the sun. The fourth planet is Mars. Mars is the fourth planet. The fifth planet is Jupiter. That's the biggest planet of them all. The sixth planet is Saturn. You gotta love those rings. Saturn is the sixth planet. Uranus is the seventh planet. And the eighth planet is Neptune. Neptune is the furthest primary planet from the Sun. Let's look at each of the eight primary planets. The first planet is Mercury. Here is where Mercury is. It is the closest planet to the Sun, okay? And the Sun is super duper hot, so guess what? Mercury is a really, really hot planet. In fact, Mercury is four times hotter than boiling water. Have you ever seen boiling water? It's so hot. It's boiling. It can cook things. It's really, really hot. If you barely touch it, you will hurt yourself so bad. Well, Mercury is four times hotter than that. Oh, my goodness. It is a very hot planet, four times hotter than boiling water. Mercury is one of the rocky planets. There are four rocky planets, and Mercury is one of them. Oh, and Mercury, it is the smallest primary planet. Mercury is so much smaller than the other planets. Tiny little, little baby Mercury. It's the smallest planet of the primary planet. So if you think of a small planet, think of Mercury. It's small. It's hot. You wouldn't want to live there. The next planet, planet 2, is Venus. Venus is right here. It's the second planet from the sun. Now this is interesting. Venus is called Earth's twin. And the reason for that is they are a very similar size. They're almost the same size. And what's interesting, they're both rocky planets, just like Mercury is. And Earth and Venus are made of similar rocks. So they're pretty much the same size, very similar size, and they're made of the same stuff. It's almost like the Earth and the planet Venus are twins. Hey, did you know every day on Venus is a cloudy day? And the clouds are yellow! Oh, that's such a gross color for clouds. <laughs> Clouds are much better when they're other colors than yellow, so the sunlight doesn't actually hit the surface of Venus. It's just a cloudy day, 
every day forever, but that's okay because there's no life on Venus, so nobody's crying about it. And this is cool. Venus is the closest planet to Earth. It is the easiest planet to see in the sky. You don't even need a telescope. How cool is that? The third planet is, well, ours, the Earth. The Earth is the third planet. Here is where the Earth is. Yep, it's the third planet from the Sun. By the way, these planets never line up like this. We just have it like this so you can see the order of the planets, but they're normally very, very jumbled. They don't line up like this. Just wanted to share that. But the Earth is the third planet from the Sun. Here's a picture of the ocean and some seagulls that are in some of the shallow parts of the water. It's interesting. Earth is the only planet we know of that has oceans and life on it. Earth is one of the rocky planets. Yeah, we live on a massive rock that has oceans, that has life. I mean, that's absolutely incredible. Remember, four of the planets are rocky planets. Earth has one moon. The moon orbits the Earth like the Earth orbits the Sun. Wow, there's our planet. <laughs> That's where we live, the Earth. The fourth planet is Mars. Mars is right here, in between Earth and Jupiter. What color is Mars? Look at Mars. What color is that? Yeah, it's kind of like a reddish, orange. Because of its color, Mars is called the Red Planet. So if anyone asks you, what's the Red Planet? Tell them, hey, the Red Planet is Mars. Even though it is red, it is not hot. It is much colder than Earth because remember, Mars is further from the sun than the Earth. So Mars, it's red, it almost looks like it would be hot, but it's cold. Hey, is there life on Mars? That's a really good question that a lot of scientists have been trying to answer for a long time. Well, scientists believe there used to be water on Mars. If there was water, there may have been life, and even stranger, there are some scientists that believe we may still find basic forms of life still living on Mars. Mars is the fourth rocky planet. Remember, we said there are only four rocky planets, so it's the last of the rocky planets. Mars has volcanoes and valleys just like Earth. They're just sometimes much bigger. In fact, there's a volcano on Mars that's as big as the state of Texas. Wow, <laughs> huge. And this is kind of cool. Mars has two moons. They are both very small, okay? They're small moons, which is good. You know, Mars has a couple moons. It's nice. We've got a moon. Mars has two moons, you know? Mars is the fourth planet from the sun, and it's in between the Earth and Jupiter. The fifth planet is Jupiter. Jupiter, the first of the gas planets. Here is where Jupiter is. It's the massive planet between Mars and Saturn. I mean, Jupiter is huge. It's the biggest planet in our solar system. In fact, all of the other planets could fit in Jupiter and there would be extra room. All of the other planets could fit inside of Jupiter. That's how big Jupiter is. And this is amazing. Jupiter has at least 63 moons. And we say at least because they're still discovering more. Wow. And because Jupiter is a gas planet, if you ever visited it, you would just fall right through. Just kidding. You would float. I mean, you, they wouldn't fall. The gravity wouldn't be there. You would just kind of float around and, you know. 
Jupiter is the giant gas planet in between Mars and Saturn. The sixth planet is Saturn, another gas planet. Here is Saturn, the sixth planet from the Sun. You could spot it easily because of those huge rings, and it's in between Jupiter and Uranus. Hey, did you know Saturn's rings are made of ice? <laughs> oh my goodness, how cool that must be! Whoo, whoo, icy rings! Those rings are made of ice, wow! Like Jupiter, Saturn has a lot of moons. Saturn has 62 moons. Wow, tons and tons of moons. What's up with Jupiter and Saturn, right? And this is pretty awesome. Saturn is the farthest planet you can see without a telescope. That's right, you can see Saturn with your own eyes without a telescope. Look, Mommy and Daddy, I see Saturn with my own eyes. <laughs> There's Saturn, I see the rings and everything. Saturn is a gas planet that's the sixth planet from the Sun and is in between Jupiter and Uranus. The seventh planet is Uranus, another gas planet. Uranus is the seventh planet from the Sun and is in between Saturn and Neptune. Both Uranus and Neptune are the only planets you can't see without a telescope, so it took a while for them to be discovered. Now this is neat. William Herschel discovered Uranus in 1781. It took us a long time to finally find the planet Uranus. Uranus is a gas planet that is made of gas and liquid. What's cool is Uranus has rings just like Saturn has rings. Yeah. Scientists believe the rings of Uranus could be pieces of broken moons. We don't know for sure, but that's really fascinating if that's the case. Speaking of moons, Uranus has 27 moons. 27 moons! I mean, we just have one! You know, 27! Uranus is the seventh planet from the Sun and is in between Saturn and Neptune. The eighth and final planet is Neptune. Hey, that means the first four planets are rocky planets and the last four planets are gas planets. So here is where Neptune is. It's the furthest planet from the Sun. Like Uranus, Neptune is a gas planet that is also made of liquid. Neptune was discovered in 1846 when Uranus was being studied. They were like, wait a second, there's a whole other planet here on the end. Let's call it Neptune. Neptune is known for its storms, the worst storms in the solar system. In fact, winds reach over 1,000 miles per hour on Neptune. Woo! That's pretty intense. Neptune has 14 known moons, but scientists believe there may be more. Here's Neptune, the furthest planet from the Sun. You have done such an amazing job with us today. Today we learned planets are round objects that orbit the Sun. The word orbit means to circle around. Basically, the planets are round objects that go around the Sun. We learned there are two types of planets, primary planets, and there are eight primary planets, and dwarf planets, there are five dwarf planets. 
And here are all eight primary planets. They're familiar friends now. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. The first four planets are rocky planets. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are rocky planets. The four planets furthest from the Sun are the gas planets. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are gas planets. You're doing great. You're increasing your skills just like this racer, you know, racing on the water. You're increasing your skills. You're doing a wonderful job. And next, we are going to learn about sharks, uh huh? Sharks, this is a video so many of you have asked for. It's time. It's time for the shark video. Sharks are an amazing type of fish in the ocean. Isn't that interesting? Sharks are fish. Sharks are amazing fish. Now the picture most of us have in our minds when we think of sharks isn't always the case. You see, there are 440 types of sharks and they can be quite different from one another. For example, the whale shark is the largest type of shark. It gets over 40 feet long. Wow! But the dwarf lantern shark is the smallest shark. It is only about 6 inches and can fit in your hand. Yeah. Wow, this is not what most people picture when they picture a shark. But the dwarf lantern shark is just as much a shark as the whale shark is. Remember, there are 440 types of sharks, so they don't all look like this guy, you know? Here's the thing, even though there are so many different types of sharks, all sharks have certain things in common. For example, sharks don't have any bones. The skeleton of a shark is made of cartilage. That goes for all sharks. Sharks don't have bones, and it's interesting because most other fish do have bones, but sharks don't. Okay, so the skeleton of a shark is made of cartilage, but what is cartilage? What does that mean? What is cartilage? Okay, this is going to sound weird, but touch your ears and move them around with your fingers. That rubbery material in your ear is called cartilage. Isn't that amazing? There's some cartilage in your body, just like there's cartilage in the body of a shark. The skeleton of a shark is made of cartilage, which makes a shark very flexible, kind of like your ears, right? Your ears were kind of rubbery and flexible when you touched them. That's the way the skeleton of a shark is, which helps a shark move around in special ways. It makes a shark very flexible. Hey, you want to know what's not flexible? Shark's teeth! Aha! Uh -huh. Shark's teeth! This is interesting. A shark uses its teeth to bite, but not to chew. Whatever they bite that goes into their mouths, sharks swallow whole. We use our teeth not just to bite, but to chew. But a shark only uses its teeth to bite. And a shark can have a lot of teeth in its lifetime. Now here's the crazy part. A shark may have as many as 20,000 teeth during its life. There are rows of replacement teeth that in case a tooth gets broken or falls off and gets lost, a new tooth emerges. Now we've already mentioned there are 440 types of sharks. In fact, you're probably sick of hearing the fact that there are 440 types of sharks. How many types of sharks are there? How many? 
four hundred okay, four hundred and forty. Alright, we're gonna just show you four of our favorites. There are a lot of other cool sharks. We're missing a lot of them. We're gonna show you four sharks right now so that if you see these sharks in the future you'll be like, Oh, I know what type of shark that is. The first shark is the whale shark, and we've already talked about how the whale shark is the largest shark in the world! Yeah! But what's cool about whale sharks, they have these white spots, and they're very gentle. So even though they're huge, they're very gentle. In fact, some whale sharks have even let divers sit on top of them. How would you like to ride a whale shark? What? Next, we're going to show you the great white shark, perhaps the most famous shark of them all. This is the shark that most people think of when they think of sharks, and the great white shark is really intense, 23 feet long, and they eat all kinds of things, dolphins, sea lions, whales, seals, and even other sharks. Next is the hammerhead shark, which gets its name because its head looks like a hammer, which it kind of sounds like a mean name, like, you know, some of the other sharks were like, hey, hammerhead, and he was like, hey, you know, don't call me that, but, you know, the name kind of stuck. The hammerhead shark, it's interesting, that's actually an advantage for the hammerhead shark. It helps with the swimming and also helps with the eyesight. The eyesight of the hammerhead shark is much better better, especially at gauging distance, than other sharks. Finally, there's the Thresher Shark. The Thresher Shark is a very strong shark known for its very, very long tail. And that tail can be huge. In fact, the tail of a Thresher Shark can weigh as many as 300 pounds or more. Wow, the Thresher Shark. Those are just four amazing types of sharks. We left out so many. But just understand, sharks are incredible creatures. And as humans, we need sharks. A lot of people don't realize how much we need sharks. You see, sharks have an important job, a very important job. And it's not babysitting fish because, Fred, I don't trust you with Henry. I really don't. I really don't think that you can be trusted with Henry because I think what we're looking at here is a snack time, all right? And uh, you're, you're just not the best babysitter, okay? I don't really trust that Henry's going to make it through, okay? So what is a shark's important job? What do sharks do? Here's their job. Sharks balance the ocean ecosystem. The ocean just wouldn't run as well without sharks. And there are a lot of ways that sharks balance the ocean ecosystem. But we're going to give you one specific way just so you can see how important sharks are. So here is our example. Sharks feed on herbivores that eat coral reef. And you might say, well, how does that impact us? How is that important? Well, in places where there aren't enough sharks, coral reef has been wiped out and it's replaced with this gross, nasty algae. It's not just coral reef that gets affected. All different types of creatures in the ocean would be affected by that. The balance is held together by these amazing fish called sharks with a skeleton made of cartilage that work hard to balance the ocean. Even though they don't realize what they're doing, they're helping maintain the diversity and the beauty of the ocean. Now here's the sad part. 100 million sharks are killed every year by people. Think about that. 100 million sharks are killed every year by people. Thankfully, there are organizations that are working to protect sharks. We need sharks. Sharks aren't bad. They're not mean. They're not evil. They balance the ocean ecosystem. They have a very important job, and they need to be left alone, and they need to be protected. One final note before we leave. 
You know, a lot of people misunderstand sharks and think that sharks are mean. But sharks don't like biting people. When a shark bites someone, it is because they think that that person is a sea creature. In other words, sharks like to leave us alone and they want to be left alone. We can protect them. You know, they have an important job to do. And let's be honest, they're super cool. We appreciate you watching our video on sharks and we hope to see you next video. Wow, you completed the video. That is so impressive. Well, you might notice there's a circle right here on this video page that you can click to subscribe to our channel or you can click this rectangle to go to another one of our videos. But keep learning. Learning is so cool.